Hello friends, Namaskar. Welcome to this module. In this video session, we are going to talk about case discussions from topic subject of community medicine. See, PSM or community medicine, it's not like any other branch or any other clinical medicine where you have a doctor or a nurse and a patient and OPD scenario or emergency ward scenario. In community medicine, the whole population or the village or the town or the city, that is our OPD. And let us say one person who gets a disease, this person, why did he get the disease? Not because he wanted the disease. The concept of community medicine is that this person who gets a disease is because the society or the population or the community in which he lives, he or she lives, that whole society has a higher propensity to get the disease or higher tendency to get the disease. And therefore, it is important to look at the disease from community perspective. That is what is community medicine. In clinical case discussions, I will be, uh, it will be kind of a separate phenomena where we are going to discuss a couple of cases, around 10 cases I'm going to discuss. And uh, every case will be attached to some of the knowledge and the competency based on the uh, competency based medical education curriculum, CBMA curriculum that you have. And uh, with each cases, there will be some of the MCQs which we are going to discuss. Right. So let us take on the first case, the competency and the knowledge component that we'll be taking up is uh, epidemiology and study design. The case number one is some of the media reports. That's important for us to know that the media reports. So like newspapers, journals, articles and research trials discuss about some rare adverse events about thromboembolic phenomena or thromboembolic events after COVID vaccines. So some newspapers are publishing that. We already know that COVID vaccine like Covishield, AstraZeneca, Chad OX1 strain, there had been some reports about uh, thromboembolic phenomena related to these vaccines. So the question number one is that which of the following is the most appropriate study design? What do you think to study this uh, adverse event, which is a rare adverse event? What do you think is the best study design? Options are cohort studies, case control, randomized, quasi-experimental designs or the cross-sectional studies. What do you think which of the following is the best study? See, uh, if you want to just assess any association, any risk factor or any preventive factor with any disease or the outcome, you can have multiple options like you can have simple basic basic case control studies, cohort studies, randomized trials or pre-post study designs, right? If you look at this very basic design, you are going to take, let us say, for example, I take 100 people with thromboembolic phenomena, that is they are with the disease, and I take on the other hand 100 people without thromboembolic phenomena, so they, they become my controls. And the other hand, they become my cases. And I uh, ask them that, Bhaiya ji, did you take the vaccine? Yes or no? Did you take the risk factor? Yes or no? So this is a typical example of a case control study design. There are huge problems in case control study designs. Who, who is the person who you are going to say is thromboembolic phenomena? You have to classify them. And maybe they might tell vaccine yes, vaccine no. We don't know that. So there could be a lot of problems in case control study designs. We can also do something called as cohort studies. For example, let us say I take 100 people, 100 people, they were vaccinated. So if I take 100 people who were vaccinated and I follow them up for a certain period of time and then I divide it into people who get thromboembolic phenomena, yes or no. What is this typical example? This uh, that the slide that you saw, this is a typical example of a cohort study. Of course, cohort studies had their own limitations like long time taking and they'll have attrition bias. People may fall out of the study and so on. Next is you can have a very wonderful type of study design where you will take group A and group B. 100 people in group A and 100 people in group A, B. So in group A, you give the vaccine. That is my experimental group. In group B, you do not give the vaccine. And then you definitely see who gets thromboembolic phenomena, yes or no. So that's a very good study design. It has a very good internal validity. I'll talk about validities later on. So it has, it has a very good, it's a very powerful study design because you, define who will get the vaccine and you say you don't get the vaccine and then you see whether people get thromboembolic phenomena yes or no it's a very good standardized study design but of course there's a huge problem that, that is you can't say to a person that bhaiya ji you go there and i'll give you a vaccine you are nobody to say that and you can't say that bhaiya you go there and i'll not give you a vaccine that is not possible you you, you don't decide about these things right it, everybody has their own right of decision so uh, uh, rct designs overall grossly speaking they are very powerful but they have a lot of ethical problems so if you see another type of study designs that could be like pre post study designs for example let us say we are talking about thromboembolic phenomena i see how much is thromboembolic phenomena how many people were reported with thromboembolism in year 2001 to 2002 when probably there was no covid-19 and no covid-19 vaccines 
and I compare the thromboembolic phenomena. So that is my threshold. I compare the thromboembolic phenomena, the prevalence of thromboembolic or the incidence of thromboembolic phenomena in year 2020 to 2021 compared with the 2001 and 2. So there is a time distribution. So vaccine before the vaccine was introduced, after the vaccine, it is the same uh, population. You see a single population. You can take a country. You take Italy, you take France, you take Sri Lanka, you take India, you take Pakistan, you take any country and see thromboembolism before uh, that vaccine and you see after that vaccine that is a typical example of a pre post study design that is before and after pre post study designs right so there is another type of study that you can uh, actually do so what you can do is okay you want me to assess about thromboembolic phenomena that is thromboembolic phenomena compared with the vaccine okay so what I'll do is I'll go to the area, I'll do a survey of the whole area. In the survey, I find out that, okay, these many people were vaccinated. That is a huge majority of the people. This box inside the box you see is the vaccinated. And this small portion you see over here, these are the people who got thromboembolic phenomena. Of course, there's a very uh, basic type of study design. This is you're doing a survey. This is actually a cross-sectional study design. So you can have a lot of study designs over here, right? So now the question comes, which one is a better study design or what do you think is the best study design out of all these or is there something else? Out of all these, itna to samaj mein aaya, this is what you have understood till now that RCT designs, they have very strong internal validity. I'll talk about validity very soon and provide a very robust, they are biologically very robust evidence. But RCT has that problem of uh, that randomize, eh? RCT is a randomized clinical trial, that randomization element that, okay, this is the person, he is randomized into experimental group or randomized into control group. Eh? That randomization becomes a problem now. That you are nobody to randomize here. How can you say to me that, okay, it's COVID pandemic and you don't take a vaccine. How will you say that? So that randomization becomes a problem. Therefore, we uh, have a separate study design that is called as a new study design called as QED design. These are quasi-experimental designs. These are called as quasi-experimental designs. Quasi-experimental designs. So these quasi, quasi is a Spanish word, it means partial. Huh? So quasi means partial, that they are partially uh, randomized. There is some partial limit of randomization. The QED designs, they depend on a very basic phenomena that there are two types of population in the country, in the village or in the area or in the world. There are two people. Whenever you're talking of quasi, it, the concept is that there are two people. Who are those two people? One will be eligible and one will be ineligible. Very simple to understand. If you talk about the eligible population, that is they are eligible for taking vaccines. Let us say our country says that age more than 14 years, people will get a COVID vaccine. So automatically common sense, age more than 14 years will become the eligible population and obviously age less than 14 years will become ineligible population. On the same manner, let us say I introduce a vaccine in district A and in district B, there is no vaccine. So automatically district B becomes ineligible and district A becomes eligible. Let us say I introduce a vaccine in males only. So males will become eligible, eligible population and females will become ineligible. So what I want to say is that quasi designs, you do not randomize. There is already a natural level of randomization based on some factors. So that natural level of randomized groups we take into account. Listen to it very carefully and uh, probably you'll understand it. It's slightly uh, a higher level of understanding. So if you take about the natural groups, you can have eligible population and ineligible population. Now, the complication starts that within the eligible population, let us say age more than 14 years, they are eligible. So within the eligible population, now the problem starts that there may be some people who are vaccinated and some people who are not vaccinated. For vaccine trials, we usually take these quasi designs. So that is what is the principle that there will be some people who are vaccinated and there will be some people in the eligible population who are unvaccinated. So V E E means eligible minus means unvaccinated. Ineligible population, common sense, they are ineligible V I and they are common sense all have to be unvaccinated. So primarily you will have two groups, eligible, ineligible, within the eligible, vaccinated, unvaccinated, ineligible is totally unvaccinated. So technically speaking, there are three groups, one, two, and you have these three groups. Did you get this point? So now, now the game starts. Now, if you want to listen very carefully, that's all the end of the game. 
If you want to compare the direct effect of the vaccine, you have a very good vaccine, BCG vaccine, leprosy vaccine, HIV vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine, typhoid vaccine, any vaccine, cervical cancer vaccine, any vaccine, you have a very good vaccine, you want to see the effect of the vaccine. You give vaccine to one group and you do not give to another group. So that is, you compare the direct effect of the vaccine by comparing the people in group one with the people in group two, that is within the eligible population, you compare the vaccinated and unvaccinated, that is a direct effect of the vaccine. You can see the incidence of disease among these people and the other people or you can see the incidence of thromboembolic phenomena or the adverse effects in group 1 and group 2. That is a direct effect. But the point over here is that there may be, if you are talking about the effect of the vaccine, if you are talking about generally the effect of vaccines, you want to study the real effects of vaccine. Don't you think there is something called as herd immunity? That people Listen very carefully. What is herd immunity? People who are not vaccinated, they are also pre protected. Why? Because the majority of the people were vaccinated. So the transmission of the disease cannot happen to these people. So the unvaccinated people, they are primarily protected. Why? Because of the protected, uh, vaccinated people, right? So how to assess that herd immunity? The herd immunity can be assessed by the incidence of disease or the effect of the vaccine or the chances of having disease in the group 2, that is the unvaccinated people in the eligible group that is the group 2 and you compare it with the group 3. Am I correct? So eligible population and ineligible population, this gives us the indirect effect of the vaccine. That is what we called, call as herd immunity. So how do you assess the basic, primarily the biological effects or the direct effects of vaccine that is to compare within the eligible population? If you take the unvaccinated from eligible and the unvaccinated from ineligible, that will give us the effect of the herd immunity that is called as indirect effect. Now, if you want to see the total effect, the total effect, overall effect is incidence of that risk factor or that thromboembolic phenomena or incidence of disease in the group 1 you see, compare it with the group 3. That is called as the total effect. It is called as the total effect of the vaccine. That is a chance of having that risk factor in vaccinated and chance of having risk factor or that thromboembolic phenomena or that adverse event in the unvaccinated among the ineligible population that is going to give us the real effect. Now the overall effect, this is the final effect. The final effect is chance of getting the thromboembolic phenomena. This includes the herd immunity, population factors, all the factors. Chance of getting the disease or the risk factor in group 1 and in group 2 combined you see. So incidence in the exposed population or the eligible, not exposed, sorry, eligible population. You see incidence in the eligible population and you compare it with the group 3 that is the incidence of that risk factor or disease in non-eligible or ineligible population, ineligible population or the non-eligible population. So did you understand the best effect is given by the overall effect based on, you do not randomize based on the quasi-randomized trials that is based on the natural randomization. So that was regarding the vaccine effects. Whenever you're talking about the positive effects of the vaccine or the negative effects of the vaccine, all the studies are very good. Cohort studies is very nice. Case control is nice. Okay. Randomization is a very good study, very good study. But quasi-experimental designs, they are the ideal or the best type of study designs whenever we are talking about vaccines. Quasi-designs, they score slightly better than the randomized trials. And of course, cross-sectional is not a very good design. So that was regarding your first case, uh, first question. Now, there is another question with the same case. So we are still talking about the case number one. Some of the media reports and research trials discuss about adverse events. Find out which of the following AEFI category you are talking about. So if you get the thromboembolic phenomena and you are a medical officer, you are a PHC officer, you are a public health officer, you are the district immunization officer. So if you are a public health professional, which category of AEFI will you put this under? So you already should be knowing that AEFI, adverse event following immunization. They are categorized into these five broad categories. You can have the product related. That is the product related means that the vaccine itself has that problem. You can't say that uh, that is because of some human error or quality error. That is the vaccine was supposed to have that side effect. So that is what is inherent factor. Next is we can have quality related that while manufacturing a certain batch of vaccines, there were some quality issues. There were non-standardized protocols which were followed and probably because of that, there were some vaccine issues. So that could be related to the medical devices or the syringe was non-sterile or something like that. That is what is quality related. It is a very dangerous, it is a very dangerous type of side effect. See inherent death is there, you can't do with that. 
So the, you always will have to uh, weigh the risk and the benefit. The benefits of the vaccine, they are always, but they are usually much more than the risk associated with the vaccine. So inherent is important, but it's not like once you put it into the public health, then it's, uh, you can't say that every vaccine is 100% safe, right? Quality related, they are very important areas because that you, you can have a lot of people affected with that. Then is one of the most important error, most important and one of the very dangerous error is immunization error. Most common problem that we have is immunization error. And the point is that this immunization error happens because of silly uh, decisions because you were not able to train people or people were not appropriately trained or adequately trained. And these are very largely preventable uh, adverse event following immunization. Immunization, if, they, if the MCQ asks you which of the following is the most important error, immunization error, which is the most dangerous error, immunization error, but quality related affects a lot of people. And again, it is dangerous. Then you can have anxiety related or coincidental anxiety is like uh, you get a vaccine and you are already anxious. So you already you don't uh, uh, after COVID-19 vaccines, many people, they had that uh, problem that you should not rub. You keep your arm like this. So after two days, if you keep your arm like this, your arm becomes so that is anxiety. Coincidental is you took the vaccine in the evening, you took ice cream and you get cough and cold. You say that is because of the vaccine. So coincidental is and anxiety related. They're not very serious errors. So uh, seriousness happens with the quality related or the immunization errors. If you talk about the adverse events, they can be graded into mild, moderate and severe. So in fact, not mild, moderate, severe, mild, severe and serious adverse events. Mild is when the adverse events, they are generally self-limiting and they, there is just minor fever or local pain or tenderness and some systemic symptoms are very mild. Severe AEFI when happens when there is some very high grade fever or there could be anaphylaxis which does not need any uh, hospitalization. But whenever there is any hospitalization or of course if the death happens or there is a lot of clustering of AEFI that is called as serious AEFI. So in this MCQ, if you're talking about thromboembolic phenomena, they are not mild. They can be thromboembolic phenomena can either be related to the serious side effects or the severe AEFI. So the thromboembolic phenomena could broadly be put into severe and serious AEFI. And of course, thromboembolic phenomena, thromboembolic phenomena, they are predominantly which type of uh, AEFI? They are thromboembolic phenomena. They are usually associated as a product related they are most probably a product related side effects because they are not at all coincidental immunization error quality error Qual immunization error will lead to like uh, sepsis happening or things like these and that too will happen to large number of people and quality related will also happen to large number of people so there's just uh, general information for you to know that aefi it is very important uh, activity in india if you uh, work as a public health officer anytime you are responsible to report any type of AEFI to the government of India. There is a separate AEFI reporting format. A lot of institutes and organizations are working with this AEFI reporting format. You can see this format on the screen. So that is the format AEFI reporting format or the AEFI reporting form. Who will report AEFI? If you are uh, tackling any severe type of AEFI or any mild type of AEFI, it is usually an accountable officer that is the district immunization officer. They are responsible people. So you as public health officer or you are medical officer, you report to the district immunization officer and in turn DIO will report to the government of India. Now, uh, in terms of serious or very severe uh, AEFI, it is usually the higher post that is state immunization officer. A lot of organizations as immunization technical unit that is very active in AEFI, ITSU. ITSU is very uh, active in uh, tackling AEFI. You can have, you are talking about pharmacovigilance, vaccine vigilance and so on. So we have the AEFI technical collaborating secretary, uh, uh, collaborating center, AEFI secretariat and very important, you have these central drug laboratories. So whenever AEFI is reported in India, the the samples or the vials or the syringes whatever is you think is the problem so sample vial syringe they are all sent to the central drug laboratories we have them in Kolkata we have them in Gorakhpur you have uh, in National Institute of Virology Pune so you have all these central drug research laboratories where the AEFI is being tackled we also, uh, I would take this opportunity to talk to you about CDSCO. CDSCO talks about the drug standards and the vaccine standards in India. CDSCO has six zonal offices. You have North, South, East, West. 
plus you have two special zonal offices one is in Gujarat Ahmedabad another is in Telangana Hyderabad so the CDS core is responsible for uh, for drug control quality drug quality control that is to identify whether the drug is appropriate to be used in the market or it is labeled as counterfeit substandard falsified or unregistered medical products for counterfeit medicine is which are made with the intention to cheat you wanted to take paracetamol but instead of paracetamol you get chalk powder that is counterfeit medicine you can have substandard medicine where the amount of paracetamol was less so it was supposed to be 500 it came out to be 200 then you have falsified products these are uh, misrepresented products or the source of composition is uh, falsified it is deliberately changed unregistered are which have not never went to the cds code so that is what is the best answer over here which of the following category of aefi is in context over here that is product related aefi right now moving over to case number two so the case number two, uh, the competency and the knowledge component that we'll be talking or discussing is about outbreak investigations, epidemic definitions, and a little bit about hepatitis. The case number two is field reports showed 35 cases of individuals with the mild grade fever with dark colored urine. So 35 people in a defined area, they were having dark colored urine. And some people also reported paleness in the skin. The reports are only from one specific area locality since last 10 weeks only. So the again, the point is that what is the source of information? Now you are getting field reports. It is not media reports. Field report means directly from the ASHA worker, Anganwadi worker or the sub centers. So they have reported that there are some people who are getting dark color urine with mild grade of fever. So which of the following statement is are correct? Multiple options can be correct over here. So what do you think? Report as outbreak of investigation and start investigation. Re uh, related to iron deficiency, anemia and malnutrition as sporadic cases. It is This is endemic in India and does not need panic reporting. The first step is to verify diagnosis and evidence of outbreak. The follow-up of cases for next seven days and see how the disease trends. Gather more data from the nearby areas to assess and compare the disease. Which of the following do you think is are correct? So you have to mark the correct one. So this is the case that we get as a public health uh, professional or you are a district epidemiologist and what are you going to do? So what are you tackling over here? This is a direct case that I have taken from the news report a few weeks back. We got uh, hepatitis A government to set up health camps as seven die and 60 uh, were affected with virus in Assam. So these are the media reports that I had taken. So this is regarding the hepatitis A virus. We already know that how are you going to investigate the cases? You have to first thing is always to diagnose the case. If you're talking about hepatitis A, you already know that hepatitis A beta, it is a single stranded coronavirus family, single stranded non enveloped virus. The period of communicability like the hepatitis A, if you talk about the communicability, let us take a new slide communicability factors of hepatitis A. See, you already know hepatitis is of five types A, B, C and D and E. A and E, the first and fifth, they are both fecal oral, B, C and D. They all three are the parenteral mode of transmission, parenteral or sexual or the blood mode of transmission. But hepatitis A and hepatitis E, they both are essentially fecal oral mode of transmission. So whenever you're talking about a huge number of cases, it is usually fecal oral mode of mechanism. And most commonly associated is hepatitis A as the most common outbreaks that we definitely get it is food and waterborne hepatitis A. So if you talk about the communicability of hepatitis A, the incubation period is from 10 to 50 days beta. And if you talk about the period of communicability, if you talk about the period of communicability that is usually ranging that is period of communicability is usually ranging if this is the onset of uh, jaundice, it is usually uh, ranging from two weeks before the onset of jaundice to two weeks after the onset of jaundice. That is the maximum time. So one to two weeks after jaundice and two weeks before. So that means that hepatitis A can also have incubatory carriers incubatory carriers can be seen in hepatitis A. So that becomes as important public health uh, point over here that people don't spread the disease. Of course, they do spread the disease after they get the disease, but they also spread the disease before they even show the sign and symptoms of disease. That is very important for us to know from public health point of view regarding the communicability factors. 
mostly hepatitis A would present as like mild grade fever, there is malaise, there is intense loss of appetite. A loss of appetite is one of the main features in hepatitis A. You have nausea, abdominal pain, plus the, the typical symptoms that the people will get is dark urine, there would be clay colored stools. These are like very important uh, pathological points over here, clay stool, dark urine and jaundice of course. So if you know about hepatitis A, if you talk about the viral markers in the blood, hepatitis A initially will of course increase the liver enzymes, but then which is the first antibody which comes that is IgM. This stays for roughly around 8 to 12 weeks, 8 to 12 weeks it is stay in the body. So you can say it is maximum till 90 days. Hepatitis A IgM antibody stays in the body for up to three months. But then slowly hepatitis A IgG component antibody also comes over and it stays in the body for some months to years. So if you want to see previous uh, hepatitis A infection, you talk about IgG. If you see the recent onset of transmissions, you talk about IgM antibodies. So that was regarding the antibody levels and a little bit about the disease. Now coming to whenever there is outbreak. Do you think we should do investigations, yes or no? Before doing the investigation, whenever there is outbreak, we always will see a clustering of cases. These are early warning symptoms. Acute illness, if it happens, acute death, if it happens like death because of unknown disease, unknown etiology, high vector density, specifically talking about malaria and dengue or lymphatic filariasis, kala azar, increase in deaths or shift in age distribution, natural disasters, all these are earning warning symptoms of outbreak. So what did we have in our case? We saw acute illness of unknown etiology that was reported to us from the field reports. So would you start the investigation? Definitely, most of the times we will start the investigation because it depends on uh, various factors as the number of cases, severity of disease. Uh, are there any preventive me measures which we of course have for, uh, for hepatitis A? We do have the preventive measures. So we will definitely start with investigation. There is no doubt in that. Next is what are the steps of investigation? If beta you are a UG student, you are watching this video right now. This is a very important exam question for you. What are the steps in investigation? But if in case you are watching this video module just for your PG entrance exam, then steps of investigation, of course it is important, but only two, three important MCQs come over here. What is the first step in investigation? It is always to verify the diagnosis. I was working as a district immunization, a district epidemiologist in one of the union territories in India and there was outbreak of hepatitis in the area which was reported to us. I'm telling you a true story now. So the first thing that the DHS, Director of Health Services, he told me was that, uh, Beta, do you think that you are tackling hepatitis A only? Are you very sure? Could it be hepatitis E? Could it be any other illness? So you have to, first thing is, while reporting to the senior, you have to be very confident that what are the diagnosis that is there. So first is always to verify the diagnosis. That is one of the very basic step important from your MCQ exams. The second line is always to establish whether there is epidemic. So that is what important comes over here. When do you call epidemic? When do you call sporadic? See, sporadic means scattered cases. That is some cases here and there. So definitely in this case, you were getting 35 case reports. 35 case reports have been there. So this is definitely not scattered. Scattered means one or two cases here and there. Then you have endemic. What do you mean by endemic? Endemic means persistent, persistent presence of disease, persistent presence of disease in a defined area. So technically we are seeing that in case report over here, this case report says that the disease has started coming from last eight, 10 weeks only. So there were no cases before that. So this is definitely not endemic as well. Then you have, what do you mean by epidemic? Beta epidemic means a rise in cases, rise in number of cases, which is, which is very important. Number, rise in number of cases which is more than 80% of the expected frequency or which is more than two standard deviations, which is more than plus two standard deviations, which is more than 80% of expected frequency or which is more than two standard deviation that is definitely called as epidemic. So then you also have something called as pandemic. Then you also have something called as pandemic. Pandemic means the disease is spread beyond boundaries, beyond the area of, uh, of uh, jurisdictional uh, distributions and beyond geographical areas. So it crosses two continents. Very important pandemic is when the disease crosses 
crosses two continents or the two WHO regions. Two WHO regions. How many WHO regions are there? There are six WHO regions. So when a disease will cross that, that is called as pandemic. So if you understand all this, common sense, what is this? This is definitely an epidemic. Why? Because you see large number of cases within a short span of time. So this is definitely, almost definitely an epidemic. The definition you already know. So which of the following statement is our correct? Report as outbreak of infection yes that is correct and start investigation yes definitely why because it's we are talking of probably because of hepatitis a virus infection it is related to iron deficiency anemia this paleness could be related to iron deficiency but not the dark urine and malnutrition is not there this is false this is false answer this is endemic in India. This is true and does not need panic reporting. This is false because reporting has to be done in panic because this is it could spread to a massive number. The first step is to verify diagnosis and evidence of outbreak. This is also true. Option D is also true. Follow up the cases for next seven days to see how the disease trends. This is kind of false. You don't follow up the cases. You have to diagnose the case and treat start treatment over there and to take some remedial actions. You have to find out that this outbreak happened because of what? Some person was chef, some water was problem in hepatitis A or the food was problem or the chef was problem or the cook was problem, whatever is the problem, you have to solve that. So you don't just simply do follow. Gather more data from the nearby areas to assess and compare. Yes, definitely we are going to gather the areas because if you see the steps in investigation, I talked to you about the steps in investigation, you have to define the population at risk. That is the second important or the third important step. So you have to find the area in which the uh, investigate in which the epidemic has taken place. You do case management, case definitions, you do lab testing, and then you evaluate for other risk factors. And then you do some theoretical stuff. You do data analysis, find out hypothesis, test the hypothesis, and then implement the control and remedial measures, whatever your hypothesis says. So gather more data is also a correct answer over here. So which of the following you're going to mark as the best possible answers? You are going to mark option number A, option number D and option number F as your best possible answers in this particular question. So now coming over to the next part of this case number two, we are still with the case number two where 35 people had reported hepatitis A. So now the next question, question number four says that which of the following statement is are correct? Multiple options are correct over here. What is this type of outbreak? Is it a common source single exposure outbreak which shows rapid rise and rapid fall? Is it common source multiple exposure outbreak which shows secondary waves? What do you think? Which of the statement is correct? So this case could be example of common source multiple exposure outbreak. Common source multiple is associated with person to person transmission. Propagated epidemic may, pre may be preceded. Okay, propagated epidemic may be preceded by common source multiple exposure outbreak. Which of the following do you think is our correct statement? So uh, what do you think is the correct statement? What do you think? So which of the following are the correct statement? If you just look at the different types of epidemic, probably this question is pertaining to different types of epidemic. If you talk about different types of epidemic, beta, we can have two types of epidemic. We can either have a common source or we can have multiple sources. The multiple sources, multiple source is called as propagated epidemic where everybody starts transmitting and common sources where there is single source. Now the common source which is a single source now there could be single exposure or there could be multiple exposures. So we can have something called as CSSE common source single exposure or CSME that is common source multiple exposures or we can have propagated epidemic. Right. So if you talk about common source single exposure, if you talk about single exposure, that is one exposure, this is also called as point source. So we can also call it as SEP, single exposure point source. OK, so if you talk about single exposure point source, there will be number of cases happen within one incubation period. So there is clustering of cases within one incubation period in a common source single exposure that is point source single exposure. Whereas if you talk about multiple exposure, that is the single case was there, people will come drink water and go, people will come drink water and go, people will come drink water and go. So these cases keep on increasing and they keep on increasing for a very, very long time. So there is cases are spread over more than one incubation period. There are secondary waves of cases which you see. There are secondary waves, these small waves that you can see, these are called as secondary waves. So in common source, multiple exposure secondary waves are seen. Please note, there are no secondary waves. There are no secondary waves in single exposure point source or common source. 
Okay. Now in propagated epidemic, this one is spreading to 50, this one is spreading to 20, this one is spreading to 50. So 50, 20, 50, they all spread to next thousands of people. So one will spread to 200. So the how will the epidemic curve look like? It will go, go like increasing all the time. So there is explosive increase in number of cases there is explosive increase in number of cases and over here you don't see secondary waves technically we call them as multiple waves multiple waves bigger waves are seen and uh, what is the hallmark the hallmark is there is person to person transmission so now this will spread to 50 50 will spread to 5000 so people will keep on spreading whereas in both these cases common source cases in the common source or point source that is multiple exposure point source so you can have steps and maps in multiple exposure point source there is only one source and therefore there is no person to person there is no person to person transmission if you understand this then let us uh, go back and solve this question what is the, which of the following statement is correct common source that is a single source and single exposure outbreak shows a rapid rise and rapid fall no that rapid rise uh, yeah of course single exposure it will show rapid rise and rapid fall but that is not the case over here so definitely which of the following statement is correct is this true yes this is true because single exposure single source it will show rapid rise and rapid fall clustering of cases within one incubation period is definitely seen so a option is a correct answer a is correct answer b common source multiple exposures so you get multiple exposures show secondary waves this is also true common source multiple exposures will also so show secondary waves this is also true this case could be example of common source multiple exposure outbreak yes beta what happens is that hepatitis a there could be confusion right now or controversy uh, amongst the students right now just listen to me if you talk about hepatitis A, hepatitis A usually starts, usually start, the, uh, the key word is start. It usually starts as a single source, multiple exposure outbreak that is usually one nidus. There is one person who is a carrier of hepatitis A or there could be some food product which was uh, infected with hepatitis A because the person who was making it was hepatitis A. So people will get a lot of hepatitis A from that single source. But slowly over time, what happens is slowly over time, the single source outbreak can become as propagated epidemic because what happens is in the initial start, one person is infected and this will infect many people because people will come and eat food over here. So now slowly, this is what is a MEPS, multiple exposure point source. But then slowly these different people, they also start transmitting between each of them and the infection becomes a propagated epidemic. Do you understand this? So if the question says, what is hepatitis A? Usually we say that hepatitis A occurs in outbreaks. It is usually from a common source, multiple exposure outbreaks. So this option C is also true. Common source multiple exposure is associated with person to person transmission. This is a wrong answer. It is not associated with person to person transmission. Propagated epidemics may be preceded by common source multiple exposure outbreak. This is also true. That is what I was trying to explain just now. So which of the following statements are correct? A, B, C and E. They all are correct in in this question but yes from this case what is this case defining as this case is common source multiple exposures which may further land up into propagated epidemic so it depends on at what level of uh, epidemic are you actually investigating the case so you can either find a propagated epidemic or you could be catching the disease outbreak in early stages where you would say that no this is not a propagated epidemic there's just a simple case of not a simple this is just a case of multiple exposure point source epidemic or common source epidemic so what are you going to mark over here a b c and e these are the correct answers coming to the next mcq again from the same case so we are still on case number two the field report shows 35 cases of people with the hepatitis A and so on. Which of the following statement is correct for the control of hepatitis A outbreak? So mode of transmission is the weakest link in chain of transmission. Control is interruption of mode of transmission and have zero new cases. Hand washing is important method for control of transmission. Live attenuated freeze drive vaccine for hepatitis A can be used for mask prophylaxis and control of reservoir is the most effective way for control of hepatitis. What do you think? Which of the following is our correct answers? You have to find the correct ones. 
if you talk about chains of infection so chain of infection you already know that there is the agent now this agent where does it stay what is the natural habitat the natural habitat the natural habitat of an agent that is called as reservoir if the reservoir starts transmitting that is called as source there is definitely a portal of exit from the source and then there is mode of transmission then there is portal of entry into the host and then there is a susceptible host who gets the agent and the agent goes back to the reservoir or the source that's how it goes so the weakest part in this whole chain of transmission that is the mode of transmission this is the weakest link the weakest link in the chain of transmission that is the mode of transmission that is the weakest part next in line you should be knowing what do you mean by control elimination eradication beta control means there is a decrease in number of cases there is decrease in number of cases and disease is no more no more a public health problem there is the disease is no more a public health problem that is what is control what do you mean by elimination elimination means no new cases no new cases is what is elimination please note that how do you eliminate it is by interruption of transmission interruption of the transmission you break the chain of transmission that is what is elimination so the the keyword is there are no new cases the keyword and control for your exam is that the disease is no more a public health problem the disease will occur in the population but at a lower pace what do you mean by eradication eradication it's a very fancy word eradication means the agent does not exist in nature the agent does not exist in nature there is no agent so common sense no agent no cases no new cases common sense but the agent is eradicated that is what is eradicated agent is eliminated or agent is finished off that is what is eradicated so if you understand this now it is important for us to know that how do you control this hepatitis a outbreak to control the hepatitis a outbreak we can have the control of reservoir control of transmission or you can control the susceptible population reservoir who is the reservoir in hepatitis a in case of hepatitis a the reservoir is human so you cannot finish the humans you cannot say that every human with hepatitis a should die that is not possible so hepatitis a is going to stay in humans because you cannot control the reservoir it is very difficult to control the reservoir because common sense you also remember from the communicability that the hepatitis a will have incubatory carriers so control of reservoir is important we can have it is important but not very very important it's not easy it's not easy to do this uh, control of reservoir it is not at all easy you can control reservoir by uh, eliminating the humans or to have total sanitation total sanitation barrier is made all these will define as controlling reservoir how do you stop the chain of transmission control the transmission this is most important it is the most important it is the most important activity control of transmission how will you do that complete like total hand washing how does the how does the hiv virus spread it is fecal so hand washing is one of the very important uh, mechanisms of controlling of transmission hand washing we can have uh, complete sanitation sanitation so these are very important one of the most important is to control the transmission by hand washing and by sanitation last is how do you control the susceptible population this is also effective this can be done by specific protection specific protection what do you mean by specific protection we can give them vaccines so just a brief about vaccines for hepatitis a beta there are two vaccines for hepatitis a we can have uh, two types of vaccine one is a live attenuated vaccine another is inactivated vaccine the inactivated vaccine that is most commonly used it is most commonly used it is available in different countries this inactivated vaccine is given in uh, two doses it is hm175 strain the live attenuated vaccine it's a freeze dry uh, vaccine called as biovac a and it is only uh, like uh, defined to the use in china it is not very commonly used and it is a single dose vaccine we also have for hepatitis a the hepatitis a immunoglobulin this M a immunoglobulin should be given within 2 weeks of exposure to hepatitis a at the dose of 0.02 mg to ml ml per kg that is a single dose of hepatitis a immunoglobulin but the effect lasts only 6 to 8 weeks 
the effect is going to last only for six to eight weeks. So it's not very, very fancy protective. But yes, in case of a known HIV hepatitis A exposure, we can give this immunoglobulin. So what is the best answer you're going to mark? Mode of transmission is weakest in the link of chain of infection. Mode of transmission, yes, it is the weakest link. That is correct. Control is interrupt mode of transmission. No control is not interruption in mode of transmission. It is control is just to decrease the number of cases by treating the disease or to finding the cases and have zero new cases. This is false. Hand washing is important method of control of transmission. This is also true. Hand washing is definitely important mode of um, uh, important method of control of transmission. Live attenuated freeze dried vaccine can be used for mass prophylaxis. This is false. It is not used. We can use hepatitis A inactivated, formaldehyde inactivated vaccine. And control of reservoir is the most effective way. Control of reservoir is the most effective way. It is not a very effective way of control of uh, hepatitis. It is control of transmission or susceptible population. So that is also false. So which of the following are correct? A and C, they both are correct options over here in this question. Now moving over to case number three, the knowledge and the competency component of this uh, case that we will be learning is about biomedical research, understanding the p-values, null hypothesis type one and the type two errors. The case goes like a large multicentric Cochrane based meta-analysis have shown non-superior benefits, non-superior benefits of dexmedetomidine, dexmedetomidine uh, over propofol. In your college, a final year MBBS student conducted a study to compare the effects of dexmedetomidine, I, I'll call it as dexmed, and propofol in cases of total IV analgesia, intravenous analgesia. She took a sample of 16 cases undergoing TIA and divided them randomly into the experimental group with dexmed and into the control group with propofol. The dexmed group shows better hemodynamic stability and lower airway collapse with a p-value of 0.01, 95% CI and 80% power. So that is the case that we are tackling that uh, a large multicentric Cochrane based meta-analysis has shown this. So uh, what do you think which of the following statement correct interpretation of the case of the study which is done by the MBBS student what do you think which of the following is the correct one. So one thing before I start uh, talking about this do you know what is a Cochrane? Cochrane is online software or uh, you can say a website Cochrane. So you can visit the Cochrane.org website. It is a collection of systematic reviews, systematic reviews, and it is a collection of all the meta analysis which is done over the globe. And it contains all the standardized meta analysis and systematic reviews. It's a very beautiful collection of all the evidence based medicine. So a large multicentric Cochrane based meta analysis. Meta analysis is one of the best uh, evidence that we have. It shows non-superior benefits, non-superior benefit of Dexmed over Propofol. That means Dexmed and Propofol, we cannot say, the Cochrane said that the, there is a non-superior benefit. That means there was some benefit, but it is not categorically very superior. You can't say that it's very good. If you get 60 marks and your friend gets 63 marks, we don't say that your friend has very, very high marks. We say your friend has high marks, but it is not very, he's not superior to you. Okay, he's got more marks, right? So in the same manner, this is the story. So in your college, a final year MBBS girl, she conducted study to do take Dexmed and Propofol and she did the study. So which of the following statement do you think is correct? A study shows significantly higher effect by Dexmed for the study by MBBS shows significantly higher effect by Dexmed for hemodynamic stability. The study shows non-significant higher effect by Dexmed for hemodynamic stability. Study has only 95% chance that Dexmed may be better than Propofol. Study has small sample with low p-value, hence is considered non-significant. There is 95% chance that Dexmed will show a better effect. What do you think which of the following statement is correct? So correct interpretation. I would also like to talk to you that how do you interpret in terms of the study designs? How will you interpret in terms of the study designs for this question? So if you want to interpret this, this question says that the p-value is how much? P-value is 0 0.0001. Yeah, 0 0.001. 0 0.001 with 95% confidence intervals or limits and it has 80% power. So what do you mean by all this? You should know that p-values, first talking about the p-values, beta p-values can be less than 0.05 or it can be more than 0.05. If it is more than 0.05, 
more than p if the p value is more than 0.05 that means there is no effect which is found this p value is called as a non significant p value and what do you do in case there is no effect found that means the drug a and the drug b they were all same or you can say that both groups or whatever number of groups both groups are same or you can say there is no effect of the particular drug or you can say there is non significant effect so what do you do to the null hypothesis what do you mean by the null hypothesis what do you mean by null hypothesis what do you think you mean by null hypothesis null hypothesis means that both the groups are same there is no effect so if the null hypothesis means that there is no effect or both the groups are same what do you do in this case the null hypothesis is accepted or rejected it is accepted okay are you getting this if the p value is more less than 0.05 if it is less than 0.05 that means the effect is found that means the effect is found and this effect it is called as a significant p value it is called as a significant p value and what does it mean it means that both the groups are not same that one group is better or the other group is worse or not so better and the last point is what will you do to the null hypothesis better you already know that null hypothesis it means what it means that there is no effect so in case the p value comes out to be less than 0.05 what does it mean that the null hypothesis should be accepted or rejected the null hypothesis should be rejected the null hypothesis should be rejected right so what do you think you understand by this you see that the p value is 0.01 0.001 that means the p value is significant that means the null hypothesis has to be rejected now coming to this second part of what do you mean by 95% confidence 95% confidence limits means that they have taken plus minus two standard deviation or 1.96 standard error as the normal zone that means that this study can be relied upon there is a definite relevance in the study 80% power what do you mean by 80% power 80% power it is con it, like power what do you mean by power is equal to 1 minus beta error power is equal to 1 minus beta error beta error that is what is type 2 errors so definitely higher power means lower error okay so based on this understanding now if you understand this it is uh, more than 80% is usually we take in statistics 80% as a good threshold so anything which is 80 or more than 80 that is considered as more power or less beta anything which is 95 or more confidence limit that is taken as a good study and p value is 0.001 which is a significant p value so now if you understand all these terminologies let's just uh, see what the options are the study shows a significantly higher effect this is true of by dexmed for hemodynamic stability this is true why because significant is 0 0.001 the study shows non significant this is false answer this is false answer it has only 95% chance that dexmed may not this is false because it is not 95% chance there is more than 99.99% chance that the study has shown a positive effect the study has a small sample with small sample yes with low p value hence is considered non significant non significant galat ho gaya yahan pe it has small sample yes it has only 16 cases small sample is definitely there with low p value but is considered as non significant next is there is 95% chance that dexmed will show better effect this is also false statement this is also false statement so which of the following is the correct interpretation there is only one answer which is correct that is option a the study shows a significantly higher effect by dexmed if you understand this let us go to the next part of the question the same case that you are discussing correct interpretation of this study which is done by the mbbs student is null hypothesis but is profo null hypothesis is propofol is better than dexmed what do you think is this option true or false the study may be having some element of random error it may be associated with type 1 error and null hypothesis is rejected it may be associated with type 2 error and null hypothesis is accepted the study does not correlate with meta analysis and the study will have low internal and external validity which of the following do you think is a, a, a correct answer so if you talk about all these options null hypothesis uh, what do you mean by null hypothesis null hypothesis says that there is no effect that is propofol and dexmed they both are same so this is false answer it may be associated with some element of random error see when do you say random errors 
when do you say random errors so i'm talking about like bias or study in the study or validity of the study that's what i'm going to talk about right now so when do you say random errors beta sampling errors sampling errors are called as random errors random errors there is something uh, two types of errors you can have random errors or systematic errors random error is sampling error systematic error is bias so the way that you take the sample size she has taken only 16 number of people so the way she must have taken 16 people or the or the method of taking that sample could have been faulty so there we cannot say it's definitely there or not there but yes we can say that there may be some element of random error because that methodology of taking these 16 people which is again a low sample is not defined so yes this is true it may be associated with type 1 error and null hypothesis is rejected. See, in the previous question, you saw that p-value 0.001. It means that null hypothesis should be rejected. It is a significant p-value. So what happens is you already should be knowing that you already know that there is null hypothesis. In reality, beta, in reality, the null hypothesis may be true or in reality, it may be false. You and me are researchers. So we are researcher. We are researcher. We may accept a hypothesis, null hypothesis, or we may reject it. That depends on us. So false, it may be accepted or it may be rejected. It all depends on us. So in reality, the null hypothesis behind my back, we don't know that. It may be true. It may be false. You and me are researcher. We may accept it or reject it. So if it was true, it may be accepted or rejected. If it was false, it may be accepted or rejected. Do you understand this? If it was true, now you answer me. Pause the video and you answer me. If the uh, null hypothesis was true in real and it was true, that means there was no difference and you accept it, what did you do? Is it good or bad? It is good. So it is okay to accept a true hypothesis. In reality, it says that there is no effect. Your study says that there is no effect. So you accept the null hypothesis. In case the null hypothesis was false, that means one drug was better. Your study also says that one drug is better. So if you reject a false hypothesis, that is also okay. But now the problem starts. If you reject a true hypothesis, if you reject a true hypothesis, that is called as type one error beta. That is a galti, that is error. And if you by chance accept a hypothesis which was false, that is again a guilty that is called as type 2 error. So how did I remember? I remember that true is always one. So if there is true hypothesis, there is chance of type 1 error. If there is false hypothesis, there is chance of type 2 error. Type 1 error cannot happen if the null hypothesis was false. Did you get this? Because type 1 is associated only with the true hypothesis. So now if you understand this, what did you do? You rejected it. You reject the hypothesis. Why did you reject? Because the p-value came out to be 0 0.01. But now comes the game that what is the Cochrane studies going to tell you? The Cochrane studies, which are larger studies and they are better evidence of uh, evidence based medicine. So the larger studies tell you that there is non-superior benefit. Non-superior benefit means the real study told that the both the group drugs are same, but your study tells that no, Dexmed is superior to Propofol. In reality, the Cochrane has told that Propofol and Dexmed, they are almost similar. So what is the error that you had done, Beta? I think you should be answering it. It is a type one error. What is the error that you have, You uh, the student could have done was a type one error as the null hypothesis is rejected this is true it may be associated with type 2 error type 2 error is a power it has a re decently high power this is false the study does not correlate with meta-analysis yes this is true it does not correlate with meta-analysis that is what it went opposite the study will have low internal and external validity what do you mean by validity what do you mean by validity what do you mean by validity but a validity means validity <laughs> So validity can be of two types. You can have internal validity or you can have external validity. Internal validity means that your study, listen to it very carefully, your study was done in some sample. So if let us say you do that study again in the same population. So if you do your study again in same population, same population, you do your study again. And if you get the same results, same results that is called as good internal validity if you get the same results again and again in the same population in the same area by the same uh, criteria then we say that your study will have good internal validity okay 
But let us talk about external validity. External validity means your study was done on, on let us say your study was done in, in a small place in Chandigarh. So if your study says that Dexmed is better, is the same study equal and generalizable to a higher scale? Can we say that it happens across India or is it the same result you're going to get in France or in Germany? So external validity is about generalizability beta. Generalizabilities, that is what is external validity. It is about more sample size. So you if you have more sample size, the studies will be generalizable. But if you have very robust study design, if you have very robust study design, you, there is no bias. We say that your study will have high internal validity. But in this study, you can see that there is methodology problem. The sample size is also less. So we say there is low internal and external validity. Why? Because this uh, study was done at a very low scale and uh, not proper methodology was used. So maybe we can say that this is true. So which of the following is true? You can see that option B, option C, option E and F, they all are true over here. B, C, E and F. These are the true options in this particular case. Now coming over to case number four, a 28 year old pregnant female presents in the second month of pregnancy, that is in the first trimester to the PHC as essential obstetric care package is under NRHM or NHM, the female will be screened for gestational diabetes mellitus. So now this female comes to you in a PHC for GDM screening. Beta, the knowledge and the competency uh, guidelines uh, that we are going to discuss, the component we are going to discuss in this case is regarding the GDM screening guidelines. Then is also about the nutrition and the exercise guidelines in pregnancy, pregnant female. So the option, the question is the female should be screened for diabetes mellitus in GDM screening should be done in first ANC visit with the one step testing should be done at 20 to 24 weeks with one step testing. It should be done in the first ANC visit with two step testing and it should be 10, 20 to 24 weeks with two step. So you have to choose between one step and two step and you have to choose between the timing of, uh, of GDM screening. But uh, whatever guideline that I'm going to talk is from the national guidelines about diagnosis and management of gestational diabetes mellitus under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare National Health Mission. You already must be knowing the GDM screening guidelines that whenever the female is screened for gestational diabetes mellitus, we are going to screen the female at the earliest point. So the female is screened at the first antenatal care visit. In the first ANC visit, the female will be screened for gestational diabetes mellitus. Next is how do you screen it? The female will be given 75 grams of oral glucose, oral anhydrous glucose and this will be tested after giving 75 grams of oral anhydrous glucose the female will be tested for blood sugar blood glucose level after two hours of giving the oral glucose test this giving testing only after two hours this is called as one step testing one step testing this is called as one step testing does the female need to be fasting there is no need to be fasting no need to fast in case of GDM testing because pregnant female in India, they are already having nutritional issues, nutritional deficiency. So we don't need them to do more fasting and have more problem with the blood sugar levels. So please note, when do we do GDM screening? It is done in the first time earliest ANC visit and then in the subsequent uh, in the subsequent uh, in the subsequent visits after 24 to 28 weeks we will do the repeat testing anyways sticking to the first point you do GDM screening in the first antenatal visits and how do you do it OGTT testing oral glucose tolerance test using one step procedure in case the blood sugar of the female comes out to be in case the blood sugar of the female comes out to be comes out to be more than 140 if it is more than 140 this female who has a blood sugar of more than 140, it is labeled as GDM. In case it comes as less than 140, now you are going to do repeat testing by the same procedure, OGTT, one step testing, two hour after giving 75 grams of oral glucose uh, load. You do 24 to 28 weeks gestation. Again, same criteria. If it is more than 140 or less than 140, less than 140, congratulations, no GDM. If it is more than 140, then it is classified as GDM. So that means in GDM guidelines, how will you classify a female as GDM, gestational diabetes mellitus? It is any one positive in two testing. Two tests, if any one is positive, that is called as GDM. When do you rule out gestational diabetes mellitus in a pregnant female? If both tests, if both tests 
are negative. It is two tests which are done at earliest ANC and at 24 to 28 weeks. If they are negative, that is called as a ruled out GDM. So what is the best answer over here? The best answer is that the female should be getting the first ANC with a one step procedure. Sorry, not two step with a one step procedure. That is correct answer. That is option number A is the correct answer. Right. It is very important for us to know that some of the students may be arguing that maybe sir, uh, sir is telling wrong. Maybe because I have read it somewhere, sir, it was 24 to 28 weeks only. I contest that. I say that that is wrong because GDM testing should be done early, as early as possible. What are you going to obtain? by doing GDM testing at 24 to 28 weeks because by that time the child has already matured. There has been organogen, the pituitary has already been damaged. So the somatotrophs, they have already increased in number and in size and there is a microsomy and so on. So you do GDM screening early in time that is going to benefit the mother as a whole. There is less chance of polyhydramnios, preeclampsia, prolonged labor, obstructed labor, probably because of macrosomia, cesarean section, uterine atony. Everything is stopped by this, by early diagnosing, not at 24, at early weeks, that is earliest first trimester of pregnancy. The child is also benefited in terms of spontaneous abortions, IUDs, intrauterine defects, congenital malformations, birth injuries, neonatal hypoglycemia, very important side effect, uh, adverse effect, or you can say very, very important complication of uh, gestation diabetes mellitus to the child that is prevented by early diagnosing. So it has to be done within the first visit, very important. Next in line, next question is, which of the following statement is correct for the advice to the female at this stage? So she should be advised for 150 minute exercise per week. Under Surakshit Matritva Abhyan, a female is labeled as red category if she has comorbidity with pregnancy. If she is found to be GDM, a four-week trial is given for medical nutrition therapy. Suman scheme offers guarantee of quality for ANC services. Extra calorie intake of 70 to 85 calorie per day should be added in the diet. So which of the following do you think is the correct statement? Which of the following do you think is the correct statement over here? So talking about a uh, very important about the Surakshit Matritva Abhyan. So that is what we call as the PMSMA scheme. Under Pradhan Mantri Surakshit Matritva Abhyan, 9th of every month, there is free ANC to be done by the doctor. So to be done by the doctor, it is free ANC and done in all the PMSMA empaneled clinics. So in this, if the female comes with pregnancy induced hypertension, she is put into a blue category. If she has any high risk pregnancy, high risk pregnancy, then she is put into the red category and in case there is other comorbidity, other comorbidity as diabetes mellitus, renal disease, liver disease, thyroid disease, then she is labeled as yellow category, not red category, which was given in the question. And last, if she is a normal female, there is no problem. She is labeled as green category. So that is uh, ANC screening by the doctors, by the doctor under the Pradhan Mantri, uh, Pradhan Mantri Surakshit Matritva Abhiyan, that is PMSMA scheme. So if you talk about this, Option number B, under Surakshan Madhra, a female is labeled as a red category. If she is comorbidity, that is wrong. This should have been the yellow category. So this is false answer. Coming to uh, option number C, if she is found as GDM, a four-week trial is given for medical nutrition therapy. Please know that we have seen these guidelines earlier. So if a female is found as GDM, if the female is categorized as GDM, gestational diabetes mellitus, in these cases, if the female gets GDM, then she needs to get a two week trial for oral two week trial for medical nutrition therapy no medical nutrition therapy that is mnt there is a two week trial for the mnt that is medical nutrition therapy it is not four week it is two week trial now after the two week trial the female may have less than 120 or she may have more than 120 it is not 140 so less than 120 mgdl or more than 120 mgdl if it is less than 120 mgdl she will continue with the medical nutrition therapy as she was taking it before so now the blood sugar has decreased now in case it is still more than 120 mgdl Please note it is not 140. If it is more than 120 mgdl, now she has to take, she has to be put on insulin. And in very rare situations where insulin is not working or not available or not possible, in those cases uh, we may use metformin. But the ideal answer for you over here would be insulin. So if she is found as in uh, GDM, there is a four-week. No, this is a two-week trial. This is also false option. 
Suman scheme offers guarantee for quality of ENC services. Absolutely correct. That is what is Suman scheme stand for. Suman stands for Surakshit Matritva Ashwasan scheme. Please note it is different from PMSMA where Surakshit Matritva Abhyan. Suman is Surakshit Matritva Ashwasan. So under the Surakshit Matritva Ashwasan scheme, you have a quality of services which is good quality of services and there is a guarantee for these good quality of services. It integrates all previous luxury schemes, zero tolerance for denial of services to newborn and to female, 100% maternal death reporting, free ENC checkups, free transport, zero dose vaccination, direct uh, cash transfer to these females. So there is a Ashwasan guarantee scheme. So Suman scheme, this is true answer. This is true answer. Suman is a guarantee scheme. So coming to the last option, extra calorie intake of 75 to 80, 70 to 85 calorie should be added in the diet. Now, many of you must be thinking that no, this is wrong answer. Why? Because you all have studied about the 350 calorie excess should be taken. So that 350 is beta average. If you talk about within the trimesters, in the first trimester, it is recommended that if there is a 10 kg gestational weight gain or there is a 12 kg gestational weight gain, in the first trimester, it is 70 to 85 calories, which is to be added extra. In the second trimester, 230 to 280 calories. And in the third trimester, it is whooping 390 to 450 or 470 kilocalories to be added extra. This is to be added extra. If you combine all these, if you combine all these, then your answer comes out to be 350 calories as an average or 310 in 10 kilogram gestational weight gain or 375 in 12 kilogram gestational weight gain. So average intake in pregnancy is said to be 350 kilocalories. So the option E is also correct. This is also true. We are left with one option. She should be advised to exercise 150 minutes of exercise per week. That is absolutely correct. If you look at the WHO exercise guideline, this is for general adults. It is for general adults. For all adults, male, female, pregnant, non-pregnant. So in case the adults are there, they should be doing exercise, moderate, mild to moderate exercise of 150 minutes or in case they are doing vigorous exercise, 75 minutes of vigorous exercise is required for all the males to have a healthy lifestyle. In case of pregnancy, the number of minutes remains same. It is 150 minutes for one week. 150 minutes in one week. This could be 30 minutes for five days a week or whatever number. But there is no requirement of vigorous activity. Whatever physical activity the female was doing, she should be continuing that. So with that, what is the best answer? So option A is also true. Option A is also true. So what is the best answer? B is false and C is false. Which of the following is correct? A, D and E is the best possible answer in this question. Now moving over to case number five, beta the knowledge and the competency uh, for component for this case number five, we are going to talk about leprosy, diagnosis, management under NLEP and the indicators thereof. So a 40 year old male garbage collector by occupation. So uh, this is a true life story that I'm sharing with you. 40 year old male garbage collector by occupation from a nearby village noticed a patch on the forearm one year ago. So as everybody would have done, probably he also did the same initially he ignored. But later he contacted the Asha worker and consulted the Asha worker. Asha worker told that this is just a simple skin infection and it will go off. So he started applying a turmeric paste and so on. A few weeks later, he noticed another patch on the flanks and he also noticed that his forearm patch was now bigger. He could not feel any sensation on touching the patch. He also had some weakness in the hand where he had the patch and has some visual problems which are identified by some doctor as corneal opacities. And now he visits your HWC Health and Wellness Center PFC for consultation. So what are you going to do now? The question number 10 is the question number 10 is what is the next best step in the management of this case? Diagnose as possibacillary leprosy and start MDT. Diagnose as multibacillary leprosy and start MDT. Refer for skin slit smear examination for at least you should know that what type of leprosy are you diagnosing? The social pathology associated as low socioeconomic status and social isolation. Mass survey should be carried in the area to identify more cases. So technically this question wants uh, to know that what are you going to do to this case right now. So this is a very famous picture. You must have seen this image also. We had a very famous uh, Sanskrit scholar called as Parchure Shastri. 
Parchure Shastri who was uh, suffering from leprosy and we had Mahatma Gandhi ji who was nursing Prachure Shastri just to uh, he nursed uh, Prachure Shastri with a lot of uh, nobility and uh, dedication and loyalty and devotion he wanted to prove that there should not be any social stigma attached to the leprosy you also know that this NLEP logo that you see you know that this uh, lotus flower is there and this lotus flower represents the leprosy patient lotus is a symbol of purity and leprosy patients they are also pure and they are taken as a, a very important aspect of the society and that is what this logo also says so talking a little bit about leprosy leprosy we all know it is a gram positive non motile rod shaped bacilli it is intracellular obligate and it loves to affect it predominantly affects the schwann cells of the nerves the nerves schwann cells are affected it loves to stay in cooler area something which is less than 33 degrees ideal is 25 to 33 degrees celsius they'll stay so that is why leprosy bacilli are found in ear lobes and in cooler areas it has a long incubation period and very slow replicating and that is why epidemiologists must be saying that it is difficult to eradicate leprosy leprosy is definitely associated with a lot of social pathologies and predominantly with overcrowding low hygiene and low socio-economic status how to diagnose leprosy beta for diagnosing leprosy this is a very important mcq point that there are three cardinal features there are three cardinal features the three cardinal features are the first cardinal feature is definite loss of sensation in a pale hypopigmented or reddish patch i did not say hypopigmented or reddish patch with the uh, loss of sensation it is loss of sensation with the hypo or a hyper color patch so it is loss of sensation which is more important we say that leprosy is a disease of nerves followed by skin it is not a skin predominantly leprosy is not a dermatological disease it is a disease of the nerves which also affects the skin so it is loss of sensation with hypo or red color patch reddish patch that is what is the first cardinal feature the second is thickened or enlarged nerves thickened or enlarged nerves you get in amyloidosis you get in many neurofibromatosis you get in many diseases but thickened and large nerves with that is more important with loss of sensation that is very important loss of sensation with nerve thickening that is a pathognomonic that is a characteristic feature of leprosy so and or weakness of nerve supply can be associated third is microscopic detection of the bacilli in the skin slit smear that is the afb bacilli acid fast bacilli in mycobacterium leprosy we all know it's a acid fast bacilli talking about this nerve involvement please note that which is the most common nerve involved most common nerve involved is the ulnar nerve next is talking about this microscopic detection of the bacteria bacteriological examination if you talk about the bacteriological examination you can do it by skin smears examination that is a skin slit smear nasal smears or nasal scraping see nasal scraping is no more done because you had to insert a, a device into instrument into the nose and do the scraping from the septa it is painful it is not done nasal smears the a lot of uh, lepra bacilli is there in the nasal secretions so it is more important in untreated cases where you have to define the infectivity potential of the patient that is where the nasal smears may be important they are not used for diagnosis for diagnosing most commonly what we do is a skin smear so in skin smear the method that we take is slit and scrape so what we do is we take the skin we pinch it to just make it a little bit avascular and then we take the blade and just slit the skin with three to five millimeters of the slit so that slit is just so that the dermis is, is a slit open. There is a, a cut in the dermis. So then you take the blade and do the scraping. So it is slit and scrape, slit and scrape. That is the most common method. And what is the stain that we use? We do a ZN staining. Now we can calculate the bacteriological index or we can calculate the morphological index. Bacteriological index, please note, is for live and dead bacilli both. It tells us about the total AFB bacilli load in the person and morphological index it is only telling us about the viable bacilli. It tells us about the fully completely stained bacilli that is the morphological index. More important, more important is the bacteriological index for us uh, when we are doing the AFB staining using the slit skin smear examination. So the bacteriological index it can be graded as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So you can have 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus and so on. So please note that 3 plus whenever there is 3 plus it notes that there is high load of lepra bacilli. So when do you say 3 plus if there is you find lepra bacilli in every oil 
immersion field. When do you say negative skin test? Negative skin test is found when there are no bacilli, no bacilli in more than 100, at least 100 you should be checking, 100 to 200 oil immersion fields. If you are checking more than 100, at least in 100 you should be checking. So if you do not find any bacilli, that is zero or that is negative AFB st uh, staining. So please note that AFB, it's not a very characteristic guideline. So AFB, you don't need all the time to diagnose any one feature if it is present, any one, mind the word, any one if it is present, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, any one it is present, that is enough to categorize it as leprosy. So what are the different types of leprosy? You already must be knowing this. This is possibacillary and multibacillary. Possibacillary is when there are less than five or equal to five lesions, or if there is no nerve involvement. So that means only five lesions and no nerve involvement. That is possibacillary. Or in case there is one nerve involvement and there should not be any AFB found. In case you find any AFB that automatically becomes multibacillary or more than two nerves, two or more than two nerves and six or more than six lesions are there that automatically becomes as multibacillary leprosy. Very important for us to know. So whenever we do a case finding for leprosy, whenever we find a case for leprosy, whenever you diagnose the leprosy, whenever you diagnose the leprosy, you have to search for more cases. So that is you do case finding. So whenever you get one case of leprosy, you do case finding by contact survey, group survey or mass survey. Contact survey is that only the close contacts are surveyed. It is done in areas which have less than one per thousand prevalence. So if the prevalence is low prevalence, we do contact surveys. It's not required to do so much big survey. You will do group survey like for example, schools mein ja ke aap kar sakte hai, or in small communities you can go small communities you can take up and in those groups you do it. It is usually done if the leprosy prevalence is moderate. It is more than one per thousand. But if it is high prevalence, if the leprosy is high prevalence, which does not exist in India. In India, we don't have any high prevalence zones. That is more than 10 per thousand. If the leprosy prevalent cases are there, in those cases, you do mass survey everywhere you need to survey. So that is what is important for us to know that uh, usually in India, in India, what is the prevalence rate of leprosy? It is 0.45. We are so happy to say it is 0.45 per 10,000 population. So it is very, very less in India. So in India, what normally we are doing is contact surveys. We don't need to do group surveys or in mass surveys. So last point uh, to take off uh, from this MCQ is social pathologies. What are the social pathologies? You already know leprosy is definitely associated with social pathologies. Very important you have is unemployment, social isolation, low economic status, overcrowding and poor hygiene. These are the most important. But of course, unemployment, discrimination, social discrimination, unemployment and malnutrition. These are all related social pathologies. So if you know all these things, now come back to the MCQ. Now let's look at the MCQ. Diagnose as possibacillary leprosy. So how many lesions did this person have? This person had two lesions, one in the flank, one in the arm. Is there any nerve involvement? Yes, there. Uh, yes, there is muscle weakness and there is eye involvement also. So there is possibacillary, but now there was no uh, AFB staining. So diagnose as, please note that even if you don't have AFB staining, still you are going to diagnose and you start the MDT, you can shift it later on. So diagnose as multibacillary. No, this is not a case of multibacillary. Refer for screen test. Yes, we will refer, but not at this point of time. We are not referring for skin slit for diagnosing. If the question was to find out the uh, just do skin slit smear. Yes, we will refer this patient, but it is not mandatory for diagnosing. So because it is said as diagnosing, that is why I'm writing as false. But yes, skin slit smear is done in the cases because then only you will come to know that is the leprosy patient progressing like uh, how is the Pro progress on treatment or what is the response to treatment so definitely option a is true b is false c i have told false only because of the word diagnosing social pathology associated as with low ses and social isolation this is also true mass survey should be carried out in the area with to identify more cases this is also false why because it is not about the mass survey we only need to do the contact survey so option a and d are the correct options which i could uh, i could find and i could think over here coming to the next case question number 11 which of the following statement is are true or correct in this case so it is the same case so now possibacillary treat uh, leprosy is treated as two drugs for six months Follow-up for this patient should be done annually for five years. 
primary disability is ulcer contract uh, con contractures should always be assessed and corneal opacity is classified as grade 1 disability so what do you think is the correct answer which of the following is our correct answers options over here so let's just learn a little bit more in detail about how to tackle leprosy. So what are the rehabilitative measures available for this case? First is we have to do early diagnosis. That is what I told you, contact surveys. We do mass surveys and group surveys. We do adequate treatment. What is the treatment that we give for leprosy? Better for leprosy, we can have possibacillary leprosy. We can give them for possibacillary leprosy. We always give them two drugs. You already must be knowing and you must be contesting over here you already must be knowing and you must be contesting over here that for leprosy beta, for leprosy treatment, we have a WHO regime. WHO regime gives three drugs for possibacillary and it is also three drugs for multibacillary. Possibacillary we are giving for six months and multibacillary we are giving for 12 months. But under NLEP, NLEP we have a different regime, National Leprosy Eradication. Under NLEP, we are giving two drugs for possibacillary for six months and we are giving three drugs for multibacillary for 12 months so please note the nlep regime is slightly different than the who regime coming back to the nlep regime we are giving two drugs that is rifampicin and dapson rifampicin is given as 600 milligram to all adults age more than 14 years and dapson is given at the rate of 100 milligram daily dose in case of children children is 10 to 14 years please note child is 10 to 14 years we are giving rifampicin at the rate of 450 milligrams and we are giving dapson at the rate of 50 milligrams to all all children who get a blue color blister now in case the patient comes with a multibacillary leprosy beta in multibacillary leprosy please note we are giving all three drugs that is rifampicin dapson and clofazamine so rifampicin to adults it is given at the rate of 600 milligram supervised once a month clofazamine is given as 300 milligram once a month and it is given as 50 milligram on daily dose dapson is given as 100 milligram on daily tablets in case it is child 10 to 14 years same answer in case it is child 10 to 14 years beta, we are giving rifampicin, which is given once a month at the rate of 450 milligrams tablet once monthly. Clofazamine is given at the rate of 150 milligrams as monthly dose and also given as 50 milligrams. Please remember on alternate days. So please note that clofazamine is given as 50 milligram for adults on daily and 50 milligram as alternate for children. Plus we also give Dapson at the rate of 50 milligram on daily tablets. So that is the treatment we have for is for multi leprosy in case of adults and for child. So we also need to do contact management in all the close contacts, close contacts and three houses neighbor on left, right, up front, back, all the sides, three houses neighbors, they will get single dose rifampicin. Single dose rifampicin is the drug of choice for chemo prophylaxis of leprosy. What are the follow-up strategies? Please note that in case it is a possibacillary leprosy, we do annual follow-up. Once a year follow-up, it has to be done two times, that is for two years. In case it is a multibacillary, again we do annual follow-ups which is done for five years, five times you need to do annual follow-up. How to do disability management? Next is how to do disability management in case of leprosy. You already know that there could be disabilities in leprosy. There is nerve involvement, nerve involvement, then damage, then there is destruction. You know? So now the disabilities are basically graded as two types of disabilities. We can have primary disability or secondary. Primary means there is loss of sensation or there is nerve involvement, nerve involvement, that is all primary. There is muscle weakness. All these are primary disabilities which are probably because of the nerve involvement. But now the secondary disabilities, they don't happen because of the nerve, they happen because of the primary disability which was not treated. Nerve involvement which will cause damage, if it should be treated at the damage stage, but if it caused destruction, that is what is secondary disability. Secondary disability is because of inadequate treatment inadequate treatment that is secondary disability example is ulcers example is contractures contractures all these are secondary disabilities so you already know the various levels of disability they can also be graded so limbs that is hands and feet if there is uh, we are talking about grading so they are graded in terms of sensation i'll write it as s or they are graded in terms of muscle weakness or muscle involvement that is motor loss i'll write it as m so in grade 0 beta, 
between grade zero, there is normal sensation and there is normal muscle involvement. In grade one, the sensation is absent, but the motor involvement is normal. In grade two, the sensation is absent and the motor involvement or the muscle involvement is also there. It is also involved. Right. So that is how we grade. So usually important for us is grade two disabilities where there is motor loss and the sensory loss in eyes, specifically in eyes, the grade zero means normal eyes and grade two. We don't have grade one in eye grade zero or grade two. Grade two means there could be corneal opacities, corneal ulcers. There could be visual loss. The person cannot count fingers at six meters or there could be absent blinking. All these are graded as grade zero. So if you understand this, disability is very important and it's a frequent point for MCQ asking also. Last is about health education and awareness. So whenever you get a case of leprosy, you diagnose, you treat, you contact management, follow-ups, disability management, and then is leprosy awareness. You already must be knowing that there are mascots for leprosy beta. This is what is called as Sapna. Sapna is a school going girl child and Meena is with a parrot. It is by UNICEF. So the government of India NLEP mascot is a Sapna and the UNICEF mascot is Meena. They are small cartoon characters. They are used for promoting uh, leprosy in the leprosy awareness in the area. So if you understand this, which of the following statement is are correct in this case? Posse basilary leprosy is treated as two drugs for six months. This is true beta. In India, we treat posse with two drugs. Follow up of this patient should be done annually for five years. No, this patient is actually a posse basilary case. It should have been done for two years. This is also false. Primary disabilities as ulcers and contraction. No, it, these are not primary disabilities. These are secondary disabilities. This is also false. But anyways, disability should have been assessed. But these are not primary. These are secondary disabilities. Corneal opacity is classified as grade one. Nah, these are classified as grade two disabilities. So this is also false. So which of the following is our correct? Only option A is correct in this question, in this statement. Before I close off this whole session, I would like to tell you what are the important strategies under NLEP. Under NLEP beta, we are doing medical management that is giving them treatment, adherence of the treatment, surgical free reconstructive surgeries, free reconstructive surgeries are also being done under the NLEP program. Social uh, incentives are given to the leprosy patients in terms of travel allowance, clothes, nutrition, removing stigma, education is for awareness, treatment compliance, and also vocational training. There are many occupations where only leprosy patients are uh, are working and they are helping in, in, in their disability rehabilitation. It is more important, very important, the program or the target of the NLEP is of course to rehabilitate this patient. But at the first place, why did why do you need rehabilitation? Because that person was dehabilitating. So prevention of dehabilitation is much more important. Dehabilitation. So person was habilitated, but he went off the track that off the track should not happen. Because then only you will rehabilitate it. Are you getting it? So dehabilitation is more important and that is a early level of disability prevention. And uh, lastly, what are the indicators in leprosy? Everybody should remember what are the four important core indicators. We have ANCDR, annual new case detection rate, grade two disabilities per 10 lakh population, cure rate and prevalence rate. These are the four important leprosy indicators that we have. These are the four important NLEP leprosy indicators that we have. I would also like to tell you that the current prevalence rate of leprosy is 0.45 per 10,000 population and the ANCDR, it is 5.5. It is 5.5 per 1 lakh population. So these are latest 2022 indicators that we have for leprosy. So that was regarding the leprosy case about uh, understanding and about management of leprosy.